I want to welcome everybody to Textile Talks and we will start the conversation in another minute or so. Hi, I'm Pam Morton. I'm the executive director of the National Basketry Organization. And I want to welcome everybody to the Sakwa Textile Talk series. Um, they have invited NBO, the National Basketry Organization, to share one of our NBO Presents programs. We do this monthly. This one is titled Structures and Community. Um, to find out more about the National Basketry Organization, you can go to National Basketry, Organiza National Basketry Organization. Um, and we're really grateful to be here. Um, for more information, just go to nationalbasketry.org. And right now I'm going to introduce Amy Edelman, who will be the interviewer moderator for this conversation. And we want to make sure and thank all the sponsors for the textile talks. Um, I'll be hiding myself now and you will see me at the end of the discussion. Have a great time. Thank you, Pam. And hi, everyone. My name is Amy Adelman. I'm an artist and educator based in North Texas. I'm also on the board of director at the National Basketry Organization. And I want to thank uh, the Studio Art Quilt Associates for inviting MBO to uh, Textile Talks and allowing us to interview Ramakan O. Arwister and Nat Natalie Mibach. Uh, both of these artists create sophisticated structures that incorporate mundane objects that engage communities in various ways. Uh, Rama Khan is an artist based in San Francisco, California, and he engages the community through crochet jams. And Natalie is an artist based in Boston, Massachusetts. And she informs her audience by documenting extreme weather patterns. It's a real pleasure getting to know these incredible artists. Um, and I hope that you all enjoy this talk um, as much as um, I know I will. Um, but we're gonna be talking about who the artists are, uh, what they make and why they make. And we're gonna begin with um, by having uh, Ramakan um, talk about uh, his artwork. Hello everyone. Thank you so much for being, for being here. Uh, thank you, Amy and Pam. I'm very happy to be a part of the, uh, the talk. So um, what I want to start with is just what you see. And what you see is fabric and broken ceramics. So I grew up with a family of uh, textile workers. My, my mother and grandmother and my great-grandmother all made quilts. And uh, they also uh, made their own clothes. So for me, I, you know, my, my mother and grandmother and father worked in a textile mill in North Carolina, in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. So the whole idea of textiles is kind of like, you know, it, it runs in our family for the most part. But when I first started, I was trying my best to be a painter, but no one in my family <laughs> used oil paint or acrylic on canvas to express their worldview. I mean, they weren't walking around wearing a Picasso or anybody, you know. So the idea for me to use materials that I'm most familiar with became important to me because I was trying my best to be an artist in the traditional sense of the word where I was painting and 
showing my work as a painter and it, it wasn't it wasn't working people were not responding to my work in a way that made that was inspiring you know it was it was a lot of negativity um or re rejection so i i just thought you know instead of being angry about what's happening um why not just step back and reflect you know what am i asking from these curators and directors and museum uh directors what am i what am i asking of them you know and, and can i use my own background as a, a means to to uh create my own vision, you know, something that's uniquely mine that nobody else can touch, that no one else has, you know, that it can only be generated from me, from within. And to let go of trying to fit into a preconceived notion of what art is, you know? And so, so the minute I decided to step back and let go of trying to be a, a you know, I'd be a, an artist in a traditional sense and use materials that were authentic to my experience. That became very important to use materials that are authentic to my experience. Um, so the ceramics, that part came from when I was at a residency here in San Francisco called Recology, Artist in Residence Program, where you have access to recycled and repurposed materials at what's, what's, what's technically referred to as the dump. But it's stuff that's being recycled, not stuff that you find in the dipsy dumpsters or the dump trucks. It's all recycled material that people pay to recycle. And it is a multitude of things. So there, it was about four years ago that I decided, you know, how am I, how am I feeling on the inside? What am, I, what am I feeling? How do I, you know, it was 2016, another, elec another election uh, period. And I, I thought, well, I will, instead of trying to worry about what's happening on the outside, I thought I would spend more time what's happening on the inside of me. So I was feeling detached, thrown away, sharp and broken. That's how I felt, right? And so when I went back to the re recycling area, you know, I had been there for maybe 30 minutes and nothing was, nothing was happening until I heard this broken glass or broken ceramic sound. And when I went over there, I saw that nothing but broken ceramics and that I was, I was all misty about broken ceramics. And that's when I had my uh, epiphany that that's the material to reference my experience on the inside, broken, detached, thrown away, but not, you know, so for me, the whole idea of using fabric, which is a material that isn't necessarily associated with ceramics, and bring these two materials together because they're authentic to my experience so that they're not thrown away. I mean, usually if something breaks, you throw it away. You don't try to, you, and if you can, you, you may try to mend it. But for me, I'm not trying to change how it's broken. I just accept it as it is and weave it into my, this is crochet and sewing and some quilting techniques that my grandmother taught me to weave it in, you know, to, you know, as it is. So it becomes a it becomes a, a metaphor as a you know for a stand-in for the human body, because we too are vessels, and sometimes we feel broken, detached, thrown away, you know, angry and sharp. But we but we still want to be you know cared for, mended as we are, so that we can grow and move. So I have a lot of emotional, in my own a personal emotional attachment to the art that I make. It's extremely, extremely autobiographical. So when people come to my work and they see these broken ceramics, I hope that it has a, uh, a dreamlike experience for them, an unconscious experience where they, they, can, they can symbolically relate to what they're seeing. You know, they're used to, you know, you see all these broken images and all these, you know, um, uh, sharp and dangerous uh, materials and ceramics but they're not thrown away. So I decided to move my artwork away from being a painter, away from uh, painting and do something that was uh, authentic to my experience. And particularly if it's something outside of the fine art tradition, you know, you, just, you, don't, you don't think, people don't think of ceramics and fabric as being in a fine art, but my thing is to subvert that. So why can't fabric and ceramics or either independently or together, why can't they be considered in a fine art context? So my goal is to put this work into a fine art context. 
and not and not wait for it to happen. I I assume the credentials that it has the value that needs to be that needs to be uh, accepted as uh, fine art, regardless of the material. And that has changed my whole approach to what art is and how I make art, so that I'm not so um, worrying about how other people perceive my work. You know, I you know before I'm I'm very aware of how other people perceive it, but I also want people to accept their own creativity on their own terms. Now, these are images of Crochet Jam, which is a public event where I teach people how to crochet with no uh, focus on a finished product. Whatever they make, they accept it and they, and they keep it. So I show them single stitch crochet. And the goal is to allow the material to inform you about what it wants to become. So it's a letting go. So instead of trying to force the material into something, a rag, a rag rug, a scarf, or a pot holder. If you want to make that, that's fine. But the idea is to let go. Let go of trying to control the, the image, the, the artwork, and be surprised by what you create. Because most of us are really uh, focused on following a pattern and being told what to do. Like I show people the technique but after I show you the technique, which is a five minute learning curve, the material becomes your teacher. So you, the idea is to commune with the material, commune with the material and let it, allow it to transform into whatever it wants to be, to be you know. As, that way you are not trying to control. And we're so used to being, you know, you're so used to being controlled and controlling others. So I see Crochet Jam as a healing um, component and, and a subversive as well, because you know, we're, we're taught to respect authority. And my goal is for people within the context of the event is to maintain their own agency. You, know, you don't need me to tell you it's beautiful when you select all of the fabric and even the hook, you know, to maintain your agency so that you can be, so yeah, so that you can be creative in your own terms. So I've, I've been doing Crochet Jam for the, you know, August of next year will be 10 years. Um, and it has its roots in a, also autobiographical as well, because, you know, I, I don't want to be told what to do and I don't want to be judged by what I create. So I, I figured, well, instead of how can I make that concrete for others? And I thought, well, maybe if it was a weaving uh, event using um, repurpose, reused, um, recycled materials, and they get a chance to have a, an environment that's safe, where there's no restrictions in public, then it can become very community, uh, a, a, a community art event, and people can re relax, because we're so, there's so much going on, it's very difficult to be calm and relaxed in a public space with, with, with strangers. And I just see that being very important that my, uh, my uh, community art project, Crochet Jam, allows that type of interaction. Is there one more slide for this, Amy? That's it? You, that's you're, the last one, okay. yes. Well, I, yeah. think, I think that's good. Cool. <laughs> Thank you. I really um, love how you talk about um, talk about it in the freeing way. Yes. And not in a controlling. Yeah, liberating. So, it's, yes. It's liberated. Yes. Thank you. Um, Natalie, um, let's go ahead and uh, listen about your artwork. Okay. Uh, first of all, hello everyone. It's really been wonderful to see through the chat where all of you are from. There are really, uh, there are people from all over the world watching this. So I wanna just say hello to everyone and thank you for taking the time to, to listen to us and to um, you know, uh, share, share with us your questions afterwards. Um, I'm gonna share my screen and you're gonna be seeing some of my images as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. Um, I think one of the things that I think is really interesting about Ramakan's work and my work is that there in Ramakan's work, and this is my perception on hearing you speak now for you know the second time and having watched your work, there's this 
idea of really not quite fitting in of our traditional sense of what a basket is. And the other aspect that I find interesting that I can relate to is this need for some sort of community aspect to be part of your creative process, your create your um, practice as an artist. And I find that really interesting that we both share these two aspects and yet come about it from a very different um, from from very different angles. So I've been using basketry for over 20 years now, and I actually learned from Lois Russell, who is, of course, very well known in the basket world. She was my teacher. And in those 20 years, I have been using baskets to translate data with, specifically data related to climate change, weather, ecology. And I use the basket to translate all of that data into both uh, baskets, woven sculptures, but also musical scores. So every piece begins the same way, it begins with me collecting information from an environment. Sometimes I collect my own device uh, in my own data in specific environments where I go to the internet and I take all these numbers and I translate them into both musical scores and woven sculptures. And the reason I became a sculptor has to do because of my interest in science. So using basketry to address questions I had about science seemed very natural to me. I have always been a very tactile learner. And so when I started to focus on science in around 2000, it was very natural that I would gear or, or um, you know, pivot towards a, a process that was very tactile and very dimensional. The material that I work with is, uh, looks like this. So this is really sort of my base beginning of every piece and numbers either in a spreadsheet or in a graph or in a map. And this is sort of all my, these are my building pieces. Because I make work about weather, my work invariably becomes oftentimes seen as being political. And even if that's not my intention, because weather has been so deeply connected to climate change, it invariably brings it into the political conversation. And I find that very interesting. And there's this perception out there that no one wants to talk about climate change because it's such a loaded subject. It's it, I, People freeze up because of the political dialogue that that engulfs it or the, or the science that they may or may not completely understand. So it, it, there's, it's really hard to get people to talk about climate change, but I find that it's very easy to get people to talk about the weather because it's affecting everyone here on the planet. And I, there was a, an article that I read in 2014 that I came across by Zadie Smith called An Elegy for a Country Season. And in that article, she talks about how there is this real, there is a need for a more diverse language to talk about the weather. And I'm gonna quote you here. There's a scientific and ideological language for what's happening to the weather, but there are hardly any intimate words. And I find that really interesting. And one of the things she asks for is, you know, we can use the arts to bring in spaces uh, to create works that maybe help people develop a more nuanced language to, to help them describe what's going on in their own environment. When I'm reading a book or when I'm watching a movie, I'm always interested in those characters that are complicated. And I think even though this dialogue about climate change is oftentimes framed as denier versus alarmist, I think that's really kind of missing the point. Most people are somewhere in between, meaning we, I think most people believe in climate change, but we're also aware that we're part of the problem. So there's this sort of understanding there's a problem and not quite understanding how one can really address the problem in a in a in a constructive way and and i think there's a kind of an interesting beauty in that complex reaction that many people have towards climate change because weather and climate change is so much more than a bunch of numbers on a spreadsheet it's a human experience that's with us from the day we were born to the day we die and many of us are experiencing changes in our environment be that you know more precipitation be that forest fires, be that flooding. These are changes that are happening in our environment that we're watching and it's coming, it's kind of creating a sense of alienation. And there's a word that I really like to think about that kind of taps into that nuance of experience and it's called solastalgia, a form of emotional distress or homesickness one feels in an environment that one lives in that is undergoing change so it's no longer feels familiar. Different from nostalgia, which is a yearning for the past, the person who feels solastalgia is still living in the place in which the sense of alienation is being felt. So to me, this is sort of my entry point into 
this is the entry point that I'm trying to get at with my work. However, when I first started this in 2000, uh, I started in a very didactic way. I started by gathering information about weather and then with data collecting devices and then um, comparing my data on the internet with weather sources and historical data and climate data and then compiling all these all these numbers onto clipboards. So every clipboard you see on this slide here is once is is a sculpture. And the intent here was very much to understand science. So the the work was was art was in the service of science, I'll I'll say. What was interesting to me was that the basket really became important to me when I realized that it was a way that I could use or a, a translation method I could use to translate information with. So the more numerical the information became, uh, was presented to me, the better I could see it being translated through basketry. And so I started to use the basket as a grid, three-dimensional grid. So you have vertical and horizontal elements. And let's say you want to translate this data that's presented to you here on the right, which basically shows you when the moon and the sun rises and sets. And this is focusing on uh, the Antarctic right now. But if I take the basket and the, ba and the vertical elements in the basket are called spokes. And if you have 48 spokes that are going vertical and you assign each pair of spokes one hour of each day, you have in a sense a clock. And what I'm doing here is sculpture by a number. I simply start weaving the flat reed when the moon rises and I stop when it sets. And I do the same thing with a round reed. I start weaving when the sun is up in the sky at nine o'clock and I stop weaving when it sets at, let's say one o'clock. So what I found over time is that these really strange warps start coming about. And these warps are not me putting pressure on the basket. Those of you who are basket weavers know that uh, reed is generally woven wet. Well here, what I, the, the warping that you see, this is actually the numbers, the data sets that are contorting the grid of the basket. And so there was a dimensionality in, in these numbers that was, that was being revealed just through the, through the process of basket weaving. Once I have translated a certain number of data sets, I have a sculpture, but I also have in a sense a three-dimensional calendar. And then I can use that three-dimensional calendar and place more information on top, such as high tide readings, moon phases, and so forth. So these pieces seem very didactic to me. And after doing that for several years, I realized that I was becoming actually much more interested in how humans respond to weather as opposed to how a weather instrument records weather. Because humans are not rational and our emotions take, our emotions are a filter through which we understand weather. And so I wanted to find a way to translate the information through a medium that would allow me to bring in nuance of how the information was being read without actually changing the information. And that's where I thought of musical scores. So I started to write musical scores that are based entirely on, on weather data. So all the dots that you see on this musical score called Navigating into a New Night, all the lines, everything, all the wiggly stuff, that's, those are all data, that's all data from my weather station. The only thing that's subjective in this, in this score is the, the vertical black lines, that's the tempo reading. And what this score is about is a death in the family. And I was interested, can I write a musical score that is about grief and mourning uh, purely with objective weather data? And then I would use this data and translate it into sculptures using basketry so that the sculpture would still be able to be read as a musical score. And one of the things I noticed is I had to change the way I was approaching the basket because it's no longer about allowing the numbers to distort the surface. Now I have to build the basket in a way that you can read the information as you're moving around it to play the piece. Because the idea was I wanted people to hear the data as much as see the data and experience the data in a tactile way. So out of this began the weather score project, which has been one of the best decisions I've made. And this sort of connects me back to Ramakan. This, this, you know, when you open yourself up to a community project, you open yourself up to sorts, all sorts of vulnerabilities and misunderstandings, but also lots of opportunities. And I've been collaborating with musicians and composers all over the country and in Canada as well, who take these scores, translate them into their own musical pieces. And then we have performances alongside my exhibitions. And it's been this really fruitful conversation about 
what is data as an artistic medium? And, and can we understand things about weather and climate change that a through music and through sculpture that a graph just has a harder time getting into? So I just wanna play you a brief um, sec portion of what some of these pieces sound like. This is by um, a piece by Matthew Jackford, a West Virginia um, composer who wrote this piece that is translating wind information from the perfect storm, which happened in 1991. Uh, so I'll just let you hear just a little bit of it, a snippet of it. Um, so the last project I want to talk about is this idea of bringing in a voice of the more complicated responses that um, we're having to weather changes and climate change. And I'm very much including myself in this, in this um, mirror experience. Uh, this is the last piece I made right before the um, pandemic hit. This is actually a piece that I made for the Houston Center for Contemporary Craft. I had a show down there last fall and it's called The Madness of a Drowning Gambler and it's a triptych. And it is talking about Hurricane Harvey, but it's also trying to broaden the conversation, not just to be about Hurricane Harvey, but really about um, the other changes that are happening in our environment, in, in, in this particular environment, such as sea level rises as well. But it's also trying to address this, 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 this existential dilemma that I'm having, and I know many people are having, where you recognize you're part of the problem, but you are, but you also want to do something about it. So we are, in a sense, the madness of a, of a drowning gambler. So we are both the gambler gambling with the future, but we are also the one being gambled with. So the piece is divided into three sections, past, present, future, and moves from right to left. The right one, um, is takes data from uh, Hurricane Irma, Maria, and Harvey, which were 2017. Those were the three storms that really, um, I think, defined the, the national conversation about hurricanes in the United States, partly because the federal response was so different for these three storms. And those, those, uh, the data in, in of these three storms is, is, is um, translated in this carousel where the, the, the horses are moored off and they finally go into this gambling uh, game that you find in f fairgrounds and they then lose their mooring and go to the next segment which is the present which is uh, Hurricane Harvey so these woven mats of uh, gray and white dots those are all cloud cover readings of five um, flooding events that have that have shaped the response of Houston towards towards uh, flooding, and then cut out neighborhoods of Houston that were flooded, and lots of data. But these horses are kind of going through this 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 wall of of data and just kind of pushing everything towards the left. And then the horses then eventually go into the third one 
the third segment, which is the future, which shows you the um, this this coiled map on the bottom here is the harbor of Houston and the Gulf the Gulf uh, Coast section of of the the uh, South Texas. And Galveston Bay and so forth, and all the blue are areas that are are actually land that are flooded because of high tide, and also you have all these kind of uh, strange little houses and cities that are that are living on rafts. And the idea is, or a suggestion, if this is what maybe what it will look like in the future, where we have to build everything on rafts in order to adapt to this flooding event. So this is the last piece. I just wanted to. The reason I, I picked all these three is that I wanted to give you a sense of how storytelling is really what, what defines how I use the basket and how I use the data. And those stories and how I tell the story changes. The more I, you know, I've been in this practice now for 20 years and my understanding of data changes, the way that we consume data changes. And so has my understanding of basketry changed over time, which is one of the things I love so much about baskets because it's so it's such an incredibly versatile technique to work with. So thank you very much, Amy. Back to you. Thank you, Natalie. I really um, loved how you just um, ended with your kind of definition of baskets. There's been a lot of comment conversations in the Q&A about the definition of baskets and versus sculptures. Um, and I think on my own part, um, what I love about basketry, basket organizations, is that they're all encompassing um, from very traditional techniques to very contemporary um, techniques and materials and that there's really no, we're, we include them all. Um, my question for you though, Natalie, is, um, uh, you know, after listening to your TED talk, you, you mentioned um, how uh, the venue, um, depending on when you, where you show your artwork, that the kind of the definition or the interpretation of the work changes. Would you like to talk about that at all? Sure, yeah. So that's one of the things I really love about, um, early on there was an, an awkwardness that, that was becoming apparent in my work because it is based on scientific data. People want, there's oftentimes this, this expectation that this piece of artwork is now going to explain something. And um, also the use of basketry also kind of changes the definite how people uh, read the piece so that you can have a piece that's entirely made out of, let's say, uh, you know, weather data about a particular storm and you place it in an, a science museum and people will read it as a title chart or as a weather chart. You put it in a contemporary art museum, it'll be, it'll be read as an aesthetic object and in in the craft context, it brings up this whole conversation about baskets and the, the utility, the excuse me, the utilitarian history of basketry, and so it, it forces the viewer to question, you know, what kind of what kind of materials do we expect to find uh, when we look at scientific data? Why are we more inclined to trust a chart through which the data is uh, shown as opposed to a woven sculpture? Uh, that's using the same data. So it's, it's, it's asking the viewer to, to dig deeper into the kind of expectations, the material expectations and visual expectations we find or we bring with us when we go into these spaces, whether it's a science museum, an art museum, or a craft museum. Right, right. And then, you know, Ramakan, how, how about you? Because um, you also have shown some work after some of your crochet jams. Um, or the work made by the participants. Um, how has that work possibly um, changed um, depending if it's shown at a fair or on a street or in a gallery space? Well, that's, you know, uh, it's very similar to what, to what Natalie experienced, you know. Um, you know, I also have done these uh, maker's fairs where you, where, you know, where you, you have the work outside and everyone helps to create it and so, the whole idea that everyone's a maker changes the way that the work is appreciated as opposed to me, you know, I facilitate the event, but I don't make the piece. So when people, you know, if they're making the piece then, and, and people see them making it, then the context becomes very different and their role in how they perceive it is different. You know, so if it's a group event and then it's a finished product, 
and it's, it's hanging in a, in a gallery, then it's there to just to be observed, just, just to be looked at and appreciated, not interacted with. Right. right? Which, I, which I find, you know, you know, like in African art, the whole idea that African art is not just to be looked at, it's, it's to be used in ritual and ceremonies. So it's a Western tradition where we actually go to a museum, go to a space and look at it and not interact with it. So when I have some, like I, I was at the art fair, an art fair here in San Francisco, and I would have pieces that people could actually go to the wall, go to the wall, it's hanging on the wall, and they can crochet on the wall. Right, which is the idea like, you know, it's a finished piece. You can't touch it, it's done, right? And I like, I like the idea of them like subverting that. Well, is it done? Is it done in a, in a community space? If, if, if indeed the, the, the community, if they have something else they want to attach to it, then it's not done, uh-huh. right? Right, yeah. right. right. So, so that's really interesting because then it makes me wonder about Natalie's pieces. Natalie, when are your pieces done? Because weather is still happening. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I've <laughs> definitely had pieces that I have um, made that were about, you know, several hurricanes kind of pushed together. And then I remember when I was in, I was in Atlanta and I was setting up a piece that was uh, comparing or contrasting the stories of Hurricane Katrina and Hurricane Sandy. And just at that time, Hurricane Irma was coming up the coast and people were evacuating and, and um, it was, I had to finish up the install really quickly in order to catch one of the last few um, planes out of there. And it just, I realized that as I was installing this piece, that this piece had changed, that it was no longer, it was no longer how I understood it before Hurricane Irma happened. And so I had to rewrite the label and actually, actually had to build new pieces to to add on to this wall piece now. So I change pieces because my understanding of the weather, the, the, the hurricanes changes as well. You know, hurricanes are not, they're not clean chapters. They not only is the recovery sometimes years and years long, but a hurricane and how a community has responded to it will affect how you know, it, it affects our national conversation about hurricane recovery as, as a whole. I mean, just think about Hurricane Maria and, and how, how pitiful the federal response was in, in, in comparison to Hurricane um, Harvey. And so those two stories are always going to be, I think, uh, brought up again and again with every time that we have a, another hurricane, just to kind of understand, you know, they, they're, the relevance of these stories continues to be alive. And so I think of my work very much as changing and I have no problems changing work that has been exhibited. Uh-huh. It, wow. It, it, it's, sculptures evolve, art evolves. I mean, we evolve. I think my understanding of my work is always different. And even talking about one's work changes. Mm-hmm. Because every artist talk is an opportunity to not just share your work with others, but to re-articulate to yourself what your work is about. and. That's been changing constantly, especially since the pandemic happened. It has really made me rethink how I, I can talk about the work. So well, meaning is flux, meaning is always changing. Sure. And then um, we were talking earlier about why you make. So initially, I are you asking me or, or Ramakran? Yeah, well, I'll ask you first. Um, OK, right. so um, at first I began because I wanted to understand science better. That, that was the thrust of it. And that's why the pieces were the way they are. And that's why I was approaching the basket in a very kind of technical way. It was a grid I could use and that was what I was gonna use it for, was to translate data with. But now I make it more and more um, to engage people in conversations about the, mm-hmm. the messiness of how we are learning to live with climate change. And I think as an artist, there is a point where you you have to kind of decide where you want to exist in society as an artist. And there was a lot of pressure early on from outside that I felt that I should continue doing, you know, these data visualization projects. This is your, your work is fantastic. It's 3D sculptures, it's 3D graphs, but it felt 
empty. It felt like I wasn't really touching the human side of what this data was really talking about. And so I changed the work because I needed to reach the people. I needed to engage the community, not as a, this is how weather is, but as a, tell me what you think about weather. How, how are you feeling about sea level rise impacting your community? How do you feel about precipitation events getting stronger? So that was the impetus really. Right, right. Um, no, and it's also, um, I think your work is really incredible on the um, choice of materials besides just um, your technique of basketry, but can you talk about some of the materials that you use? So I began using reed early on because reed is, as many of you know, as basket weavers, you can't fully control reed. If you exert too much pressure, it'll break on you. So that meant reed was a perfect material to allow the numbers to twist the form so that I couldn't determine what the form would look like. And then, um, but I also use a lot of low cost materials because I, I mess up a lot. And I have to say that even after 20 years of making sculptures, the rate of failure doesn't go down. I have to mess up just as much <laughs> in order to get a piece that actually works. So I need the freedom to mess up. I need the freedom to be able to throw something away if it didn't work out. So cost is always an important part of my material. Right, right. And then um, Ramakan, you have dis discussed your materials as well. There was a question um, by a viewer who's curious if um, about how you decide what parts of the ceramics to hold, to show and what um, parts to hide, or if it's more um, intuitive. Well, you know, uh, um, thank you for that question. The idea is that I like the rough edges, the sharp broken edges to, to be, you know, to be exposed. So I'm always moving the sculpture so that the, the, the shard, so that that rough and sh that sharp broken edge is always either pointing out toward the viewer all the way around. So that's pretty much how I do it. Like when, but I had to be very careful because I have to put tape on the edges because I'm weaving them very, I'm not, I'm not wearing gloves. So I weave them very close to each other. If I get too excited and don't put tape, then it's, then, you know, then it's, you know, I need a lot of band-aids because it's, it's, they're, they're, they don't look sharp, but they are. Uh -huh. So, but I, but I want it, I want it to look, I want that, I want that, 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 that uh, yin and yang kind of thing where you, got, you have the fabric, which is soft and inviting. And then you have the sharp broken ceramics, which is it, there's an incongruence there that I, that I think that isn't, um, you know, it doesn't need to be explained, but it can be felt when people see the work. So I want mm -hmm. the edges to be very, very uh, abrupt, very dramatic if I can. The bigger the, the, bigger the shard, the better. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, and I know when we were talking um, earlier, um, did, did you have a question that you wanted to ask um, Natalie? Um, you know, yes. So um, you mentioned before about the whole idea of the, of the terminology and how people, you know, as it, as it relates to climate change, climate crisis and, you know, or extreme weather. But how does that, how does, how does the, 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 the politicalization of the, of the terms about the weather how does that affect how, you know, how you want to convey your message? Like, you know, does it how, what influences does it have on, you know, on how you communicate with the audience about your work, depending on how it's described, you know, in, in, in you know, in, um, you know, by the terms that are used? Yeah, I'm, I'm actually really glad that you asked that question because we were talking, um, earlier when we first met about the power of words. And yeah. I'm actually trying to get away from those words, uh, climate change, climate crisis, extreme weather patterns, because I think they're not very helpful in getting people to open up. Um, they're such politicized terms. There's, they, they, at this point that it just freezes people up. And so one way that I have um, tried to Kind of de-escalate the the you know the sensitivity of some of those uh, some of the subjects that I'm talking about is by 
creating pieces, creating artwork that looks very, very playful. So a lot of my work uh, looks like toys. And when people first come upon it, they oftentimes think it's for children. But you sp spend time looking at it longer and you notice little tags of temperature, you notice little um, references to, to storms. You begin to understand that there is a numerical logic holding it together. But this initial filter of letting people into these pieces through the lens of play is really, really important to me because I think it, it disarms people. And the piece that I showed earlier that was in Houston, The Madness of a Drowning Gambler, it's very complex. And there's no way that you can read the whole piece in you know, a 30 second swoop. So it forces you to go into the piece, to linger at the details in order to really understand kind of what the story is. And even when you spend a lot of time, the story is still kind of, it's, it's still not entirely clear. And, but those, those kind of rough, um, rough edges along the side is I think what enables people to start opening up. And um, so with this particular piece, I was very struck by how many people stood in front of that piece and had very emotional reactions to it. And part of that, I think, was that it was trying to bring up a conversation, a memory of Hurricane Harvey, you know, two years after it actually happened to a community that had lived through it without, without putting climate change on top or climate crisis. And just to be able to, you know, these kind of more, um, frayed pieces of a story that allow viewers to sort of enter that conversation in different ways. Um, so I hope that answered your question. Absolutely. Absolutely. The whole idea of play, you know, because everyone, you know, depending on the venue, people come in there and, and it's very um, formal. Right. So they, so and they don't want to they don't want to be perceived as not knowing what's, what they should be doing. Like, you know, am I doing this right? You know, should I you know what should I? But once well, once there's an element of that, um, that's a way for them to be engaged in the work. That isn't it isn't about being you, know, you, you can't touch it. You, you know, you, you know, you, you have to stand back from it or you have to you don't want you don't want to describe it or talk about it in a wrong way because it may you may people may think you're ignorant about you know so that people are very people are very aware about that in in a, in a fine art or depending on the venue um, of how they're perceived and how they want to relate to the work and there's all these barriers in front of them you no know? is it so how do you get how do you get, how do you remove those barriers so that you actually can get to what people are thinking because they don't you know they're they're too in, they're too on about how they're perceived in the venue. Right, and I think that's one thing I really loved about your, your approach too with a crochet jam is that your openness to it all. You know, you're giving, you're, you're teaching um, people how to do it in a very basic techniques, but then you're stepping back and that's when play can come in. Because you, you've sort of given basic parameters of material and, and you know, technique, but then it's up to them how to define and where, where to go with this. And that's, that it's, I think it's wonderful because there aren't that many opportunities I find that that are given to the public where you can just sort of engage with art in a way that isn't immediately pigeonholing it or putting it into a category of fine art, craft, this, that, you know, and, and you're in a museum, therefore you have to interact with this piece in a certain way. And now that you're outside, you're in a maker fair, you're using the same material that you're using in your artwork, but it's a different space. And, and all of a sudden, the, the, the way that the, 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 the material is being interacted with and what they're working with is much freer and open. So I think it's wonderful that you're creating these, these opportunities. I wanted to ask you a question, if I may, Amy. Definitely. Um, so I've been really interested in, in um, hearing what you've been working on since the pandemic hit. And because uh, I know it's completely changed my studio practice for practical reasons. Um, I have to figure out how to pay the bills the next two years because uh, I had all these cancellations, but also just emotionally, there's just so much going on right now that I found that my work is very, is changing quite dramatically. And I was just wondering, has, what are you working on right now in, in the studio? And are you continuing with the same body of work and theme, or are there changes that are coming up? Uh, 
is, is, that, is that for me? Yeah, yeah, it's for you. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, you know, I I decided the whole idea that um, that broken ceramics and fabric, you know, that is that to me is a way of being subversive, and it, it's a way of being like you know, it's it's not you know, this is a you know, I I like the idea of of putting this, uh, taking one thing out of one context and putting it in another context for a whole nother purpose, right? So, so with, with the pandemic, I, I have been able to like spend more time in my studio. Since my studio is my home, you know, I mean, right now I'm sitting in front of my dining room table and it, it, has, it has five sculpture pieces on top of it. Yeah. So, so, so my, my, my theory is if I have a dining room table, I have a studio. The problem now is I'm running out of space, but I I was going to be at the Headlands until they, the Headlands Center for the Arts until the pandemic, and uh, that was a little upsetting for me. And then I then it dawned on me, well, you know, you know, you can look at this. How you look at things can change your perspective, can change how you relate to things, right? So why not do in your home, turn your home into that space? Mm -hmm. You know, if you're going to be somewhere else. Oh, but why not do what you're going to do at the headlands here? You know, at, at, you know, in my home. So um, I'm looking. I'm looking at the idea of being able to uh, have a bigger space. But um, for right now, I figure that um, any space is the space that needs that that I need to work in. Because if I wait for the right space, no work gets done. You know, and if I and, and if if I, if I allow my, my emotions and my, um, and the environment and the political stuff that's happening outside derail me from the only thing I can really trust is my creativity. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's never asked me to lie or to cheat or to steal. It's only asked me to be authentic and to be courageous, right? Um, I can't say that that's been the case for other aspects of my life. But with my creativity, I may not understand it and that's okay, who does? And it may, it may not make sense, but does it need to? But it needs to be expressed. And so during the pandemic, you know, um, you know, uh, I've seen it as a way of saying, you know what, what do I value? Do I value my art enough to give it the attention because I couldn't go outside or shouldn't go outside, you know? Oh, no, for, you know, other, other than for a walk, 20 minute walk and come back, you know, there's no gathering. So what do I, you know, when I, when I'm in my space alone, what's important to me? And the answer during the pandemic has been my work. Um, and luckily, you know, I, I had a job for 20 years, so I was able to, uh, I call it graduate from that so that I could, um, so that, that pays my bills. So, um, and, the, and the Crochet Jam events, those are all honorariums. So when I do one, the organization provides an honorarium for me. So I, and I accept whatever they give me. So if, if whatever they give me, um, I accept it. So I don't, I don't have a fee. So I feel, like, I feel like I'm in a, you know, I miss them because I'm in a giving mood, you know? So, so my work has changed now in that my, my, my community art events aren't happening. So when an organization gives me something, I feel like, you know, they've given me a gift. And when I give the events to other people, I'm giving them a gift. And they're in a gift giving kind of thing. So it's, it's like a, the psychology has changed a bit. Mm -hmm. I yep. always really enjoy how you see um, things in such a positive view, Ramakan. Um, it's just really um, refreshing. Um, there, there's, there's, and this is interesting because there is a question, and they said, um, "Ramakan, your pieces ooze with life, and oh, energy, wow. and presence, and soul." I give it, uh, I give it. I give them all that I got. I mean, I give. I give every single piece, everything I got. Yes. Yes. Um, so they also ask um, that your pieces are autobiographical. Autobiographical. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and they speak to brokenness. Yeah. Um, so how is putting your work into the world healing you or revise your self-view? Uh, briefly, um, I mean, um, 
the, the idea of, of being in the arts, that there, you have to be pretty strong and courageous because it's not, it's not always, you have to create an audience for your work, really. Um, it's good that you that people create it and, and you know at the point of personal, but to, but to bring it out into a public space that that becomes for a critique, and it may not always be what you want to hear. <laughs> so, but making art, if it's going to be for yourself, that's that's one thing, and that's very important. But taking it to another level and put in public space. But I I have been trying for so long to fit my work into someone else's perspective of what I should be as a as a black gay or black queer artist. So I can let go of all of that. And so I am healed when I create what I make and it is so genuine to who I, to who and what I am instead of me trying to be something for someone else. And I, I realized a little late in life that if I'm, you know, if I'm always trying to please others, I'll never know who I am. You know, and, and that gives up a lot of your agency. When you try to please others, you, will, you give up a lot of your agency. And then there's no authenticity there because you're denying who you are for the pleasure of others. Mm -hmm. So to answer your question, the whole idea that every time I, every time I look at these things and they're like, and I, and I think, wow, how do I, get to, how do I get to broken ceramics and fabric? And, uh, and how I feel so joyful to be making them because there isn't, there isn't a pattern. Whenever the, the other material wants to, I just let it go. So, I, so I, every day is something new. So I'm healed, you know, like, like you know, I'm spiritually uh, affirmed, uh, emotionally affirmed by saying, I can let it go. I don't have to worry about it. I am the conduit for what will be in my, in my studio. I love that. <laughs> yes. Um, it's so inspiring. Um, so Natalie, um, there's also um, a question for you about, how did you um, choose weather data as opposed to you know anything else, whether it was you know water or um, another subject? Yeah, I, I chose weather because I needed something that I could collect every day that was easy to collect and that was changing enough that it could become visually interesting. And I was also interested in using weather to understand the complexity of, of climate change better. So. Um, that's why I ended up focusing on weather. Excellent. Well, wow, that was a, a really quick hour. Um, we could go on, I'm sure, for many more hours. Um, and uh, I hope that maybe you can listen to this again, contact the artists. Um, but I just want to thank everybody for being here today. And I'm going to hand it back over to Pam. Hi. Well, I thought it was an amazing conversation and I've heard it a couple of times and there's always something new and interesting to hear from all the artists. Once again, I want to thank Sakwa for giving the National Basketry Organization the opportunity to bring our program NBO Presents to your um, webinar series, Textile Talks. Um, if you want to learn more about the National Basketry Organization, go to nationalbasketry.org. We have a monthly newsletter. You can sign up on our webpage. It's called The Over Under. And also, we, of course, are grateful to the sponsors of Textile Talks and to Sakwa for giving us this amazing opportunity. I hope you all enjoyed it. We certainly, on behalf of NBO, enjoyed bringing our program to you. And thank you all for joining us. And thank you to Amy for moderating, and to Ramakan, and to Natalie for joining us. It was really a pleasure to be there with you and listen to the conversation. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.